Hi, and, and welcome everyone to today's session. Um, my name is Fife Strawn. I'm the Research Director at Jubilee Australia Research Centre. Um, filling in today for Luke Fletcher, the Executive Director, who unfortunately isn't well and isn't able to make it this afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here and to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting today. I'm dialing in from Darrell country in Wollongong, New South Wales, but I'm sure we've got people from all over Australia and beyond. So um, welcome everyone today. Um, I'm really excited about today's session, which is focused on from extraction to inclusion. And the focus of our discussion today is gonna to be around extractive development in the Pacific in particular. Um, this is an issue that Jubilee Australia Research Centre has been working on for a number of years with a particular focus on mining in Papua New Guinea in particular and logging. Um, but also looking more broadly at trends around extraction and extractive development in the region. Um, last year, working with Oakland Institute and ACT Now, um, we released a report called From Extraction to Inclusion, which had a look at Papua New Guinea's economy and the impact of extractive development, as well as some of the alternatives to extractive development. So um, Eddie Tanago from ACT Now is here today and will be able to tell you a bit more about that as well. Um, so I'm conscious that we've got a very short amount of time and we have a really exciting array of um, panel members. So I might um, start just by introducing today's panel members to you all. Oh, so we're joined today by, um, uh, by Samantha Kuman. Samantha is the Advocacy Officer at the Centre for Environmental Law and Community Rights in Papua New Guinea. Um, Selcor is a public interest law firm that seeks to provide legal advice and assistance to landowners, community-based organisations and NGOs involved in community-based natural resource management, environmental policy, research and development, and they advocate for human rights and environmental justice. We're also joined by Charles Roche, who is the Executive Director of the Minerals Policy Institute. He's a practitioner and researcher that, who's focused on understanding and reducing the impacts of mining on communities and improving unjust outcomes of mining. And he's recently completed a participatory action research PhD with Murdoch University, where he explored the outcomes and impacts of the clash between global mining and semi-subsistence communities in PNG. We're also joined today by Eddie Tanago. Eddie is the campaign manager at ACT Now in Papua New Guinea. And Eddie's areas of expertise include community engagement and mobilization, development studies and campaigning. And with, uh, last but definitely not least, we're joined by Pichamon Yofang Tong, who's an Australian Research Council DECRA Fellow and Senior Lecturer in International Relations and Development at UNSW in Canberra. Pichamon's been a Chief Investigator on multiple research projects that have focused on strengthening environmental justice and governance in Asia Pacific. And she's also the recipient of the Australian Future Leaders Prize from the Council of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. So welcome to all our panelists um, and to all our attendees. I can see it climbing up, it's up at 28 now. So that's really exciting. Um, the format for today is a round table. So we're gonna essentially have a bit of an opportunity for a question um, for, for each of our panelists and a chance for them to give a bit of a response on a focused question. And then we're hoping to save half the time in the session for Q and A. So there'll be lots of opportunities for you to share um, your questions for members of the panel today. Um, and also any thoughts that you have about some of the issues that are raised. So without further ado, I might go to our first question and our first panelist, Samantha Kuman. Um, Samantha, it's been recognized internationally that indigenous peoples have a right to give or to refuse their free prior and informed consent to development that will happen on their land or affect their land and water. But we know that in practice, free prior and informed consent or FPIC often exists in name only and that companies have a large number of ways to engineer landowner approval or get around FPIC. Um, based on CELCOR's work, could you tell us a bit about how the principle of FPIC has played out in the PNG context? Thank you, Fife, um, and good afternoon to um, all the participants in the audience as well. Um, just for, I guess, context, um, as per the Papua New Guinean um, Constitution, Section 51 talks about the freedom of, the rights and freedom of information. Um, however, we don't have legislation per se um, for the freedom of information itself. It's something that I think our government and other partners, we are trying to push that through. Um, but in Papua New Guinea, we do have challenges that are there in terms of, you know, free prior informed consent. 
most of the time the communities that we've you know worked with and we've had interventions with are not aware that they do have this thing called consent this could be related to you know perhaps our low literacy rates um, access to basic services um, and also our geography it's very uh, the terrain some places are disconnected from the rest of the world if you will for instance I just came back off from field last week and the only way I could get to this particular village was through um, dinghy by a small boat for about three hours on the open seas and, and through those kind of disconnections that are there people are not really aware of that right or even aware that you know in our constitution we have this thing called you know the right to freedom of information and um, as a Papua New Guinea they don't understand their human rights as well and also the legislations or the laws around natural resource and extractive activities. And of course, our major constitution that is there, the, or we call it here in Papua New Guinea, our mama law, the supreme law. So hence, that's why the work that we feel in CELCOR that we do is very important by providing like um, the information that we do the, with the programs that we have um, to the communities who have you know extractive resource activities on their land to make those uh, informed decisions. So many times we see that through our interventions, our programs that we run, um, it's become evident that that whole ethic process has not been played out or upheld, or sometimes it's intentionally been left out of the whole, I guess, community consultative process. And um, many times people don't really know that they have a right to withhold consent as well. So that's something that we've seen through the work that we've done. And it's, you know, it's sometimes it has that light bulb moment, like, oh, we can say no or yes to certain things or certain activities on our land. And sometimes people think that, you know, because of the powers that may be, um, the government heads or the state heads, if you will, if they give that um, permission, people are thinking that, okay, we don't have that right to say anything about um, on our land because people have, people in, you know, those places um, in those, um, certain um, political heads of the province that have been given that um, authority already. So they feel like, okay, our voices don't really mean anything. So like in the case, uh, we had a case in Leh, the second largest city um, in Papua New Guinea, an Australian company called Maya Resources Limited. They want to develop um, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific's first coal industry. And in the city of Leh, it's a metropolitan city. So smack dab in the city of Leh, um, they want to build this power plant. And through our interventions and the conversations we've had, the interviews we've conducted, the reports that we have written um, in conjunction with Jubilee Australia, um, we found out that that whole consultative process has been sort of skipped in terms of consulting the communities, consulting the greater populace of the city of Leh, um, the custodians of the traditional waters in which the coal plant is going to be sitting adjacent to, they have absolutely no idea what um, this thing called coal is, what it, um, what it will do, what's the purpose, what it's gonna look like, who gave the approval when they came in. So it's just been a sort of bypass of that whole um, ethnic process. And, through the interventions we've had in um, the city of Leh and with the traditional custodians of the land and the waters, we found out that um, they also do not know that they have you know, the right to withhold or give consent. And I guess to add salt to the wound, um, Maya Resources Limited utilized a um, uh, rugby league legend, if you will, um, Mr. Darren Lockyer as the head of business affairs to go out and I guess use that um, use that celebrity of his, as Papua New Guinea loves rugby a lot, um, to sort of entice that community consultation, but they actually did not. They had claimed that they had done a community consultative process, but they had actually gone to uh, one of the universities in situated in the city, which is mainly made up of students all over the country. And they had said that um, that was their community, co community consultative process or community meetings, but in actual fact, um, when we had gone later and asked if any of the traditional um, landowners, the clan leaders, if they had attended or if they had known what had happened, they had absolutely no idea. So in Papua New Guinea, we do see that big disconnect um, due to those other challenges that I mentioned, but um, it's something that 
we as a nation and um, I guess CELCOR um, as an organization and as a nonprofit who um, strives to you know, fight for human and environmental rights, we try to sort of bridge that gap through the programs that we have. Thanks so much, Samantha. Um, I, I'd love to ask you more about some of the work that CELCOR does um, around bridging that gap. I know we've got not a lot of time, but do you perhaps want to say, share it for a second, um, couple of minutes quickly, what some of the work that CELCOR does around that? Okay, so through law and advocacy, we promote and defend um, our environmental and human rights. So in terms of the bridging the gap, which I'm talking about, um, it, we, we have a program called Community Legal Education. So it basically um, seeks to provide information to communities, particularly in those development um, areas, particularly with um, you know, logging, mining, uh, oil and gas areas, fisheries, and now we've got coal on our hands. Um, we go to these communities upon their request or we've identified that there is a need there and um, provide that information in terms of um, giving information about basic government structure, the constitution, natural resource um, laws and human rights laws as well. And basically to inform um, our people and provide them with the information so they can make informed decisions. Thank you, sir. So much. Um, so I might turn to Charles now. Charles, you've recently completed participatory action research PhD into the potential impacts from mining at the proposed Wafi Golpu mine in Morobe province in PNG. And I understand part of that research looked at the process of dispossession and the impacts of the mine on well-being. Could you share a little bit with us about what you found? Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, Wife. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been looking at the impacts of mining in PNG for about 12 years. And then for the last six or seven years through a, a PhD at Murdoch University. So I use we a lot because I worked with uh, um, three PNG co authors. So we started looking at well being and dispossession. And then later we turned to ontological blindness, sort of an epistemological bias of impact assessment. And uh, the overall aim of looking at these conceptual approaches was to better understand the impacts of extractive lead development from a recipient perspective, and for the communities to be able to use the knowledge in their own processes of, of self-determination, which, which in itself is critical. Self-determination is, is critical component of well-being. So, so central to the, to the sort of panel topic today, we sought to understand, challenge, and disrupt existing modes of extractive lead development with the explicit aim of overcoming asymmetries of power, knowledge and influence that de deny communities a voice and even their control over their own futures. Um, so we've got, we've got the map there, a little, a little bit of backstory. So this research grew from recess, requests for assistance from communities around the Hidden Valley Mine in the Morabi province. And upon visiting them, we met more and more communities that were going to be impacted by the much larger and, and still proposed, not approved, Waif, Wafi Golpu mine. And so we sort of turned our eyes towards that, seeking to avoid problems. This is the, the Mineral Policy Institute, seeking to avoid the impacts on communities rather than just write about them. So the map's hard to see, but pretty much exactly in the middle is Ley, the capital of Morabi province. And just to the, to the, to the left of that, to the west of that, is the Wafi Golpu group of mines and, and the communities around them. So the proposal to mine and the community's questions are what actually pushed me back to uni. So I've got a semi-subsistence community in Papua New Guinea to thank me for, for finishing a PhD and some other help along the way. But we wanted to use participatory actually framework because the intent was to, um, to share and exchange information with the communities, so based on what other communities had learned from all around the world, and for the communities to be able to use this information as tools and part of an active political process. So whilst I wasn't a, a political, um, in, in that political debate per se, we were trying to provide information and share experience that was helpful to the communities. And so the journal articles um, are all to be used as tools by those communities. And they can be found on my website, charlesroach.co. The research was done in partnership with the mine affected communities and my PNG co-authors, Nwosio Walim, Eugene John and Howard Sindana 
and some of those will be very familiar to some of the, the PNG um, participants today. So they've just returned from Vinabelli, the one of the communities closest to the proposed Wafi Gopi mine. So they were there last week, and and part of the, the action research frame was for them to go back to the communities and to share those articles, including summarized and translated versions that were summarized and translated into the top Pearson. So very much trying to have research that impacts across a range of different levels. But let me touch on, on dispossession. So following Harvey's accumulation by dispossession and Holden, Nadu and Jacobson's application of it in the Philippines, we turn, we use dispossession because we think it captures much more the lived experience, that recipient effect, impacts of living with mines, with, with mining impacts, sorry. Um, it has a more sort of, human connotation and, and a more, um, more genuinely acknowledges the loss that communities uh, feel as different things are, are removed from them, whether that's they're forced to relocate or they lose access to particular parts of their environments. So when we went to talk to, so we, we coined a term extractive dispossession, which was basically applying dispossession to extractive practices. And this was very much um, influenced by the experience of Papua New Guineans with the impacts of, mining on, impacts of mining on affected communities. So we came up with 11 separate factors, just a few of them today. So one was gendered inequality and equity. And so in PNG in Morabi, we see that where women are excluded from decision-making processes and a fair share of the benefits. Imperialism and epistemicide, which I thought the communities might struggle to grasp, but it turns out they knew, once these concepts were explained, they knew them immediately because that was part of their own lived experience. It was part of the ongoing colonization progress, that process that's still occurring in Papua New Guinea. And so that's where mining continues that process of colonization and sort of disregards, disrespects and supplants existing knowledge and value systems, which is very much what happens in, in this clash between mm -hmm. predominantly Western mining companies and, and PNG communities. But displacement is the one I wanted to touch most on today. So often we use the word resettlement to talk about displacing people. But just, just can we turn to the next slide? And one more, sorry. This is the village of Vinan Valley. Um, and then the next one captures uh, disemplacement. So in this picture, the, the tree represents the village, the community basically, and WJV is the mining company. So effectively, this is Eugene showing the mining company ripping the, that community up by the roots um, and then trying to replant that community somewhere else, albeit with Western style houses. So it's, it, disemplacement rather than resettlement very much recognizes the lived relationships between yeah. families in community and yeah. time, time and space. Um, and from last week's um, visit to the communities, we know they're still very concerned about moving away from the Wafi River, from having to move to a higher mountain, restrictions on movement because of fencing around the mine sites, whether they can access land, uh, to grow gardens on. Uh, many people know PNG has a multi-tenured system. And just because you've got the bit, just because you're allowed to live somewhere doesn't mean to say you're allowed to garden there. And also a lack of housing for youth where there's no plans for additional houses um, for youth in the future. So very much this resettlement is aimed at solving a management problem, whereas disemplacement is, mm. is how people live with these experiences. Do I have time for, for a little bit? I'm, Human flourishing, or, or shall I wrap? Uh, maybe if you, I'm just think, looking at the time, and um, uh, but it would may perhaps maybe be great to touch on it after, if that's okay. Sure. Well, let me let me finish with this one bit. So we we use these both dispossession and human flourishing as tools to help communities, and our research showed that it was really useful for the communities, and that's the feedback we got again last week. I think. Part of the problem in overcoming exclusion and creating inclusion is that this is something that happened on the periphery as part of a PhD and a mind-focused charity, whereas we need to come up with ways of, of sort of main, mainstreaming this to truly expect, 
affect the experience that people in PNG and the Pacific feel. So in the words of one of the, the elders from Binnan Valley, he said, the Western model of development came and changed the lifestyle of our good plus in down, the, the lifestyle of our, of our well-being, and changed our life. And I think part of the challenge is to make sure that extractive development is a positive impact on local yeah. communities rather than uh, making a whole lot of assumptions and supplanting the values they already have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Charles, and that segues really well into what I was hoping to ask Eddie. Um, so Eddie, um, last year, ACT NOW partnered with Jubilee and the Oakland Institute to produce a report that looked at this bigger question around extractive development in PNG and its impact on social and economic development. Mm. So I wondered if you could share some of the insights from that report and particularly some of how it relates to logging. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, uh, Pfeiffer. Um, yes, the report that uh, um, was done last year together in partnership with Jubilee and uh, Auckland Institute, uh, I just that's just the major takeaways that was uh, that came out from that report from extraction to inclusion is that Papua New Guinea's uh, economic uh, development model um, during uh, prior to independence, when we have the constitutional planning committee that met after so much consultation with uh, uh, people from all around the country. Um, they had a really good document that said that um, it has to be homegrown, it has to be Papua New Guinea grown. And then after the independent, um, we seem to have gone off track. Um, and PNG has made this model that one that is more based on extractive industries, uh, on resource extraction and exports of, of natural resources. And that is something that uh, Papua New Guinea has been doing since independence. Um, what, did re what this report found out is that um, it does not really work well for Papua New Guinea. It has not benefited Papua New Guineans, even the resource owners and the, and the landowners. So with Papua New Guinea, we seem to have a lot of mines that's opened or that are being proposed and others that are currently under exploration. And we, we think that you know, the more resource, resources we extract, like gold, copper, oil palm. Um, we think that uh, we are going to improve the lives of the people. But what this report found out is that since independence, nothing has really changed for the local people, um, even, even the country as a whole. There is uh, only a few elites that are only benefiting from um, what, what has come out from um, this, the extractive industries. The majority of the people that are in the local community, and I'm sure uh, Charles Wood also has a, a um, examples of those in the in a Eden Valley and Wafu Gulf area, is that all the people all the people face is, is the, the issues that are currently now with them, um, the burden of having to lose um, forested land or, or lands for making gardens, um, you know issues so social issues. We have influx of people that have been brought in from outside. Um, and then you know you that results in in in, in shortage of, of land for gardening. There is issues of food security, and the, the more forest you clear, the more land you clear. It results in in losses of cultural sites, um, even loss of business. Um, like for example, in the West West Pomio case in in the East New Britain province, where people originally had small scale sawmilling and which was a community initiative where they would uh, do a small scale forestry and they would sell their logs within the province and even overseas. When we had this big um, Malaysian owned logging company would come in, it destroyed that business, just, it just killed it. We had other businesses like, you know, the small canteens, sale of petrol and kerosene the land and the sea transport. That was all taken up by the foreign owned logging company. So people are now without any hope, but all they think is that they have been fooled into uh, or deceived or fooled to believe that this foreign owned company will bring in all the goodies. And that is the kind of mentality we've been, we've been put in now since independence. But all we've seen is, 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 is really nothing. Um, most of the profits that are uh, from these companies that, are, that have been made from these ex resource extractions are all kept overseas. Um, and in Papua New Guinea, some of these companies are given long, long tax holidays. 
and some do even don't pay tax for years and then yet they are they're let to go free um and which is we have millions and millions that are currently uh, lost in potential uh, tax revenue in the west pomio area um we have um west pomio area is an area in in, in east new britain province and uh, and it's, it's one area that is uh, heavily logged uh, under the pretext of agriculture the government backed uh, a scheme called special agriculture business lease in which um lands totaling five million hectares of land like all throughout papua new guinea this is close to about seven million rugby league fields if you lay them all together so that's how much land that was lost under this government funded uh, government backed scheme so pomio is also one area that is covered under that scheme so after so much complaint there was a commission of inquiry that found out that most of these lands that were acquired were acquired illegally so they recommended that uh, these leases be cancelled and lands be given back to the people and to this date nothing was uh, the, the lands are still with foreigners logging is continuing oil pump planting is continuing people are there still suffering they are crying but what can be done now and the main issue one of the main issues that was found out in this commission of inquiry um, and i just like to back what samantha said earlier on in terms of fpic was that fpic is a prerequisite under the lands act um, and because of the kind of land tenure system we have uh, foreigners or even government has to get okay from the landowners through the fpic process and fpic process when i say fpic it doesn't mean that you go and get you hold a conference in a hotel room to get okay from the people and it's a long process in our culture that you have to talk and talk and talk until everyone comes to a consensus, everyone agrees. It doesn't mean that Darren Lokia goes into Unitech, sits in a, in, a, in a lecture room, and he says that I've got a concern of the people to do mining in that particular area. It doesn't make sense. So for this particular case in Pomio, FPIC was the thing that really missed out. So the rightful landowners were never given there. Um, okay. So in Pomio, there are three SABLs or the Special Agricultural Business Lease, but it's mainly logging. So they were given this lease in 2008 uh, for a total land area of 42,400 uh, 42, hectares. So, and this Malaysian company went in with the intention to clear fill the forest, get the logs and plant oil palm. This has happened and there were negative effects that we have already well documented and they are there, people are still fighting over to reclaim their land, but what can they do at this stage? The government is just always on, on the side of uh, the developers or the logger. We have a commission of inquiry that said that cancel these leases, lands must be given back to the people, but we still have this logging company that's still operating, that's still abusing the rights of the people that is still blocking the people from having access to their land so from your case is, is just an example of 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 one case but it's it paints a bigger picture that Papua New Guinea has been following a role a wrong model of development and and that particular report that we did together with the uh, uh, Auckland Institute and uh, Jubilee Australia is is an example of um, how the kind of development path that Papua New Guinea is currently taken and we've gone astray. And there is a need for us to go back. And we think that to fix that, we should have people put at the center of development. People must be made priority instead of putting, uh, having foreigners or, or foreign or development companies that are come to take center state at the, the moment. Land is, is an asset to Papua New Guinea and the government should stop attacking our, our customary land tenure, which forms the basis of our village economy and the livelihood of most of the population, almost 85% that is land dependent. There should be a ban on round log exports and communities should be involved in small scale community uh, sustainable uh, forestry activities. There should be a halt in the expansion of, of the oil palm there should be a, a ban placed on new mines. 
and most importantly, make Willis Agriculture the center of PNG's development. So those were some of the main uh, uh, highlights or some of the main points that uh, came out from that particular joint report that we did together with uh, uh, Jubilee Australia and uh, Auckland Institute. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, and there's a number of recurring themes, I think, that have come up from what you've said that yeah. really echo what Samantha and Charles have shared as well. Mm -hmm. So I might turn to Pichamon now um, to move out to the regional perspective and ask, how do you see this broader theme of extractive development and some of the issues that we've discussed here today playing out across the region? And what do you think Australia's response should be? Sure, thanks for that, Fife. Um, and I'm dialing in from Ngunnawal country. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present and emerging. So to respond to your question, Fife, um, I think to draw on the example that Eddie has given about the land grabbing, um, we have recently also seen this happen in the case of Cambodia, where under the cover of COVID-19, uh, one particular Vietnamese company went back to um, an indigenous community, took all the land, um, took back all the land, I should say, that was initially agreed upon that they would return to said indigenous community. Um, and of course, under strict COVID-19 lockdown restrictions, the community had no idea that this was going on. So by the time they came out, they realized that, well, all of their spirit mountains and whatnot have already been bulldozed by this Vietnamese company. So the point there being that when we look at extractive development across the Asia Pacific region, really we see so many and unfortunate uh, commonalities. Um, despite, you know, of course, the need to be context sensitive and all that, it really is the case that the forms, the patterns, the causes of exclusion, but also the barriers to inclusion, um, there's just so many remarkable similarities across the Pacific, um, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and beyond. And really, what I'll I'd like to focus on, um, in my intervention at least, is what I think is, is part of the kind of underlying um, fundamental cause, um, which really is the exclusive knowledge systems that these extractive models of development perpetuate and encourage, um, and which we all need to be mindful of because we ourselves, and I'm speaking here as an academic, can also be uh, responsible un unwittingly and unconsciously of perpetuating said extractive knowledge systems as well. Um, and so in that regard, um, I'm drawing here a bit on, on a project that I've been working with colleagues um, to try and understand how knowledge co-creation can happen, but also how we can prevent um, the extractive behavior when it comes to knowledge, but also, also the exclusion that happens. Um, and there is really no uh, straightforward answer to this, and it's still a work in progress, um, but it is clear that you know, the people who go into these communities seeking to fix this local situation um, are really also at risk of perpetuating these systems. And to draw on the case of illegal logging, I think what we saw in the case of Australia's response, for example, to uh, the illegal logging problem um, and its log imports, uh, in particular, the process involved in developing um, Australia's Illegal Logging Prohibition Act, or ILPA, is really a very exclusive process as well. Even though some Australian-based NGOs were involved in designing um, the, the, the Prohibition Act, um, in reality, to what extent uh, their concerns were are reflected in the final output is, is quite questionable. But at the same time, what we saw very clearly was an, a clear absence of local voices. So the voices of communities affected by illegal logging in countries like PNG, but also others in Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, and so again, this is, I think, part of a much bigger problem, obviously, mm -hmm. when it comes to power asymmetries, um, but also who has access to the re resources um, that allow for knowledge creation in the first place. Um, and even though so many of us will be familiar of the latest buzzwords like um, uh, knowledge co-production or stakeholder engagement uh, or multi-stakeholder engagement and social inclusion and so forth, um, at the end of the day, there is still there are still big gaps between what is said on paper and what actually happens in reality. So if we look at the majority of the multi-stakeholder um, engagement processes that we see, and I'm generalizing here a bit, so forgive me for that, but you know, in Southeast Asia, for example, the problem is that the language fits the bill, 
but the actual practice is is far lacking like exactly. in the sense that yeah if you look at who actually is allowed in the room it's very exclusive um at a lot of the times there will be a lot of men in the room there may be a token woman here or there um but the dynamics involved as well having you know a woman or an indigenous uh, person in the room does not immediately mean that this is inclusive right we're all aware of that at the same time having them speak doesn't mean that it's an inclusive process because that can also be quite tokenistic as well so i think what is needed is a fundamental questioning of what it means to be in partnership uh, or to be collaborating or to really try and um, bring in local voices because again at the end of the day even the terminology that we use can risk being colonial. Um, and so I think, again, the problem is not unique to the Pacific. Um, it's something that we see across the Asia Pacific region. Um, and I would really welcome ideas from people in attendance today as to how we might tackle this mm -hmm. issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pichamon. Um, and now I think we've got a little bit of time. We've got about 20 minutes for Q&A. And I think there's an instruction in the chat. I'm not sure if um, uh, that there's a Q&A button in this particular edition of Zoom um, that you can go into and you can add your questions. Um, and I see we've got a fantastically meaty first question, which was added right at the start of the session. I don't know if the other presenters have had a chance to have a look at it already, but it's been sitting in my mind as everyone's in speaking, and I think it does tie together um, a number of threads. So the question is from um, Tacey Kalamo, and it's how can we address the gap of collaboration and inclusive decision making between government institutions and the project impacted communities while being aware of compliance standards that govern extraction companies? So there's a lot in that question, um, and maybe a couple of our panelists might want to speak to it, but perhaps I might invite Eddie if you wanted to go first on, on that question. Yes, um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to speak within the context of the re report that we recently released, just last year one. So um, <clears throat> one of the main things that we um, tried to cover and one of the main recommendations we had in the report was that we wanted to make sure that people are put at the center of, of development. So people have to be really involved in the beginning and in every process of the way. Um, that is not the case here in, in Papua New Guinea. So um, one of the main recommendations we had and we think that should address the problem is that people should be involved at all levels of decision making, at all levels of implementation. So in a way, um, decisions that come, or, or things that happen, uh, they have been included in, in, in the process as well. So we thought, uh, I think that people should be very much uh, involved in every step of the way. So most times here in this country, we see that um, people are, are left outside. They are not being consulted. They are not being given the opportunity to talk. Um, and I think in the case where Charles um, was working, I, I, I hear stories of that. You know, we normally think about the people who are directly landowners, but we don't think about the people who are not landowners but who live down the river. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about when I say that people should at all levels should be involved as well. So it, it, it reduces that, that, that impact or likely impact of, the, uh, of projects that are happening in the area. Thank you, Eddie. Um, would any of the other panelists like to jump in on that question as well? Charles. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say that um, Compliance standards are sort of like the icing on top of the cake is yeah. the way I think about it. And that can help um, transfer, you know, best practice from one country, company or one country to another. But really the key here is the, the relationship between the government and the people, where what we really need is, is a much more rigorous process that's very inclusive over a long, over a long time yeah. so that communities really understand what they might be agreeing to. And I think too often international compliance standards can be used as a way that multinationals justify their behaviour rather than actually undertake the, the sort of actions that we would like to see in any sort of natural resource extraction, but is, is lacking in as much in, in almost in Australia as, in, as it is in Papua New Guinea. 
Thanks a lot, Charles. Um, I might move on to the next question. We have a question from Gary Flomenhoft um, asking Eddie and others, my understanding of the global definition of FPIC is that it doesn't require consent, only consultation. So even if F, so even FPIC is quite weak, are there other mechanisms that might be stronger to ensure local sovereignty over land? So that's a good question because I know that there can be different um, uh, you know, views put as to what FPIC um, requires. Would anyone like to um, like to jump in and, and tackle the definition of FPIC perhaps from the UN um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and then um, the second part of that question as well around local sovereignty? No, no one's, jump. Charles, yeah. <laughs> do you want to jump in? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, very briefly, a weak FPIC talks to consultation, whereas any genuine FPIC um, talks to consent. And one of the reasons I went to human flourishing eudaimonia is that self-determination is built into our concept of well-being. Yeah. So, so to me, we ask FPIC to do a little bit too much, whereas really self-determination, local sovereignty. Yeah. Like, can, can anyone make a case why any community should not have local sovereignty and self-determination? Yeah. So to me, it's, it's more a case of, of FPIC being a particular way of thinking about how local sovereignty and self-determination is guaranteed as part of these processes. But it, it's based on a very firm foundation. Thanks, Charles. And yeah, I'd also add probably to that, that I think um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People speaks about the rights of Indigenous people to give free, prior and informed consent, mm. not consultation. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, and I'm sure I can see Luke's in the, in the, somewhere in the participants, and I'm sure he would have more information on this, um, that I know that that has then been taken by other instruments and watered down to be viewed as a requirement for consultation. And I think we've seen FPIC being put into um, into guidelines and mechanisms as a consultation requirement rather than a consent requirement when at yeah. the heart of it and in the UN declaration it is about consent it's about which means the ability to say no not just the ability to say yes um, or the conditions around which you say yes but but really at the heart of FPIC is is that concept of consent which means you can say no to the development if you want to say no. Um, can I say something on the Please, Eddie, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> with regard to FPIC, I'd, I'd like to uh, make F FPIC um, a local law. Uh. So FPIC has to be seen in, a, in a, or understood and explained in a more local context than in a more, um, more international or more globally how we view FPIC. Uh. Like um, in the context of Papua New Guinea, FPIC is not something you get overnight. People do not give FPIC or people do not give okay to what they have overnight. It's a process traditionally where if there is a land that we want to garden on, we have to, they, the community or the clan comes together and they talk and talk and talk. It takes even months or years for them. They don't come to a, an easy uh, decision. The FPIC that we, we currently talk about now is that, you know, as, as Charles was referring to earlier, we saw sort of companies try to use this process to they think that they can get it, get their resources or land overnight. But in a cultural context, it takes it takes time. People sit down and talk and talk. It, it doesn't, there is no time frame to it. When there is a mining company that's or, or development that's going to happen, they have a time frame to say that this time we do this, this time we do this, this time we go for warden's hearing, this time we go for some kind of agreement signing. When it comes to decision making and FPIC within the community, there is no time frame to it. So there is a class in, so I'd like to see FPIC being uh, practiced in a more uh, appropriate local context. Thanks, Eddie. And Pitcherman, I can see your hands up. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, I think that aside from the issue being about uh, consultation or is this actually consent, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of the informed element to it and not, you know, pre of course is extremely important in this regard as well, but the informed bit is I think what is hardest to pin down, like to what extent can we say that a community is actually informed if all of the information yeah. that they've been given is very restricted or is made in a language or, you know, uses terms that they don't fully understand. Thank you, Pichamon. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, the next 
question we have is from Zanetta um, Furio-Akafa. And the question is for Eddie, um, I'm from the Solomon Islands and the issue of land grab will soon become a bigger issue. Um, however, what, what you said about the lack of inclusive decision-making with actual people of the yeah. land is so true. My question is how can we better educate and protect our communities? I might actually direct this to you, Eddie, but also Sam, it would be great to get yeah. your perspective on this yeah. as well. So perhaps Eddie, do you wanna go first? Yes, uh, the question of better education and, and, and protection of communities is a very big concern, uh, not on I'm sure also in Solomon Islands because of the number of languages we speak, the language barriers, it's very, very difficult to, you try to, um, you know, one thing you say means differently in another, in another, in another village, or even though the word talk is in we use here in Papua New Guinea, it's spoken differently in different parts of the country. So it's a very big um, issue when for us, especially advocacy groups, um, when it comes to um, better education um, for our, our local resource owners and, 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 and the protection of, of our rights. Um, so to better educate and, and protect our community, so we have groups like um, CELCO who does really community engagement, who go down to the communities and run legal education um, partnering is, is very one, one important thing that can we can also use to share resources so that we can better educate our people. Um, we also have the protection of, protect, of protecting our communities, which is the use of the law. But for here, for example, in Papua New Guinea, we see that it's a very, very um, expensive exercise because it's very, very expensive. It's very, very expensive to engage a lawyer, especially people from the village who do not have any source of income. To better educate people is that for, for my experience, working as an uh, advocate within ECNOW, um, we are an organization that is more online based, but we also have networks that we utilize. So with limited resources, we do not, we do not actually go in person to educate peoples, but we try to create networks. And we've seen network as one of the very important uh, um, ways to disseminate information. And protect, protecting communities is that people have to be, the communities have to really understand the issues first before they make informed decisions. And, and that is the first and most important thing so that we, so that they make informed decisions. And it's not good you, you let them or people are also they face the problems and then they're trying to come back and fix it. They have to be informed in the first place so they make better decisions to avoid bad things that are going to happen um, to them and, and the communities. Thank you, Eddie. Sam, would you like to add anything to that from CELCOR's work as well? Yeah, sure. I think I just to add on to what Eddie said about, um, you know, the networking aspect of um, uh, what we do here in Papua New Guinea, some of us, sometimes we're not able to go everywhere at the same time or as we would like. And um, it's just, I guess, coming together in terms of um, different, you know, environmental, um, you know, CSO groups or CBOs as well as the community-based organizations utilizing that network, uh, network um, going to those communities. And that's how we reach those communities as well. And I guess to answer, you know, Zenta, uh, Zenta's um, question, um, you know, just sharing the information, talking about it, what you've learned here, and as well as I'm not really understanding the full context of the Solomon Islands, um, I guess, perspective, mm -hmm. but um, sharing that information and education is key. Like with CELCOR's um, programs, we focus particularly on law and utilizing that law and advocacy aspect that we have, and we have that capacity to um, provide that service. Um, some other NGOs or other CBOs don't have that capacity, but then those partnerships come into play as well. And information is key. And there's, there's something going back to what um, we discussed in the earlier question, talking about that you know, aspect of informed. Um, people have to know what they are you know, getting into or what they're going to be affected by or impacted by as well. So um, how we could better educate and protect our communities just by you know, um, not just allowing ourselves to be given our given you know information from the developer from our government we are, you know have to do our own research and that's what we encourage our communities as well if you don't understand what is written on the paper given to you to sign don't sign it you can go and get more information you know seek extra information to make those informed decisions and then tell our people tell our other communities you know 
hey, we can also do the same thing, you know, gather more information to make those informed um, decisions. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, so we've got two related questions here that I might conflate. So a question from um, Luke Fletcher, Executive Director of Jubilee, who was meant to be chairing this session and has popped in the Q&A. Um, what mechanisms are there to require companies who breach or undermine free prior informed consent to face consequences for their lack of compliance? And there's a similar question from James Cox here as well, wondering about enforcement of decisions and particularly non-enforcement of yeah. decisions made against the interest of extractive operators and how this can be strengthened. Mm. So would anyone from the panel like to jump in on this question of, of how we can actually enforce um, community rights and, and require companies to face consequences? Um, I, I guess I'll just touch on a little bit of experience from Cellco. Um, there's that gray area, like I mentioned in the, uh, when I gave my um, presentation in terms of um, section 51 of our constitution talking about the right to freedom of information. However, you don't have that legislation, freedom of information as yet. So um, having that right to information, there was a extractive, I think for the experimental seabed mining um, that would have been, um, been taken, uh, it should have been, I think in 2014 or 29, uh, 2009, somewhere around there, it was supposed to have kicked off, but um, you know, through interventions from, you know, Act Now, Selco and other partners, it sort of, you know, crashed. Um, <laughs> however, that information, want of information from the communities that wasn't forthcoming. So um, those other mechanisms that um, partners use to gather their information has, you know, we had to go through the courts in order to do that. So that's just, to answer Luke's questions, um, I guess in terms of ethic and um, extracting that information from them. Thanks so much, Sam. Would any other panel members like to jump in on that one? Um, Charles, yeah. I, I think we could draw something from the question about Cambodia as well, about yeah. success stories. Unfortunately, yeah. there, there's very little um, that can be yeah. done in terms of enforcement against the actions of, you know, extractive industries, whether it's mining industries in in the in Papua New Guinea or in the Pacific or even in Australia. Um, we're not we're not very good at balancing the competing yeah. needs of local communities and um, the other objectives of extraction. Uh, so, sure, there's some that where you can take particular action against, you know, based on certain guidance mechanisms, but really this is an issue that should be tackled through the legislation yeah. of that, that yeah. home country and of the, the host country from the, the company that might be involved. Yeah, that's right. And I think this is also an issue we've looked into a bit in Jubilee as well around what, what are some of the mechanisms in Australia to hold companies yeah. to account for what they do overseas. Um, and the and I know the Human Rights Law Centre has also written quite a, an extensive paper on this, just the inadequacy of the mechanisms that we have in Australia to provide redress for communities overseas, particularly where there's human rights abuses. Um, we have the OECD National Contact Point as a non-judicial remedy that communities can go to to bring a complaint. Um, um, but so far, there's a number of, of kind of weaknesses with that mechanism, and although it's in the process of being strengthened. But in terms of legislative measures in Australia that, that you can use, um, it's really, even if, you, even if you found an appropriate legislative mechanism and there's not a lot, it, bringing a case to the courts, um, particularly if you're coming from an affected community overseas, is extremely difficult. So, yeah, I think those, that is an area that does need to be strengthened. Um, Pichamon, you had your hand up? I was just going to say that, yes, Australia doesn't have the best um, laws and regulations when it comes to enforcing things that Australian companies do overseas. Um, at the same time, I think this is the case across the board. Um, and to go to the, the question from Cambodia, I think the six, there aren't real kind of straightforward success cases. Um, there are gradations of success and depending on how one defines one's success as well. Uh, but I do think that there is some interesting developments being made in terms of um, national contact points, but also in terms of using stock exchange um, regulations, you know, really drawing on the consumer base, um, kind of using leveraging that in order to hold companies more accountable for what they do. 
is, is I think an interesting mechanism um, and one that really has the potential to also um, impact the bottom line of, of many of these firms. Fantastic, thanks Pichamon. Um, now I've been told that the session is gonna automatically end at 4.15 and it's 4.13 now. So I'm wary of asking anyone else to um, start any, uh, any lengthy response, but would any of the panelists like to say anything briefly before the, um, the session, um, oh, uh, okay. Apparently, it may not. It may not necessarily end. So, um, can I invite any of the other panelists if you'd like to make any closing remarks before we we wind up the session? Yeah, I'd just like to thank the organizers, the sponsors, and others who I have not made mention of. But uh, thanks for making this forum uh, possible and. Uh, Yes, it's a very worthwhile discussion. So I just look forward to uh, the outcomes and what's going to come out of this uh, engagement. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. And Sam? Yeah, I'd just like to just add on to Eddie and just say thank you to the sponsors and the organizers and um, our facilitators here today for um, hosting this panel as well. There's a lot of um, vital information that has been shared and I hope this gives insight to you know the issues that we have on the ground in Papua New Guinea and the Pacific as well and those challenges that we face for a better context in our, our development issues in Papua New Guinea today. Thank you and I might turn to Pichamon. Yes no thank you also but I also wonder Fife whether you could also talk about some of the projects that Jubilee has done in this space and what more yes. we can do as well to support the work that everyone here is doing. Um, good point and and thank you um, for, for that invitation, Pichamon. Yes, um, we've got quite a number of um, projects at the moment in Jubilee that are quite relevant to this space. In particular, I'd like to mention um, our Save the CPIC campaign, um, which I will try to pop a link to in the chat, um, but that campaign is focused on a proposal right now to build um, a mine on the Frida River in um, in Papua New Guinea, a large copper and gold mine that could have some really devastating environmental consequences and whether the downriver communities um, are very much not um, giving their free prior and informed consent to the building of this mine. Um, mm. That's, uh, we also have, um, we also have a number of other um, programs working with Cellcor Act Now and others um, looking at um, illegal logging in Papua New Guinea and um, and the Nogat Coal campaign that Samantha mentioned as well, um, focused on um, focused on the development of a coal industry in Papua New Guinea, as well as some work in Fiji. Um, we've recently released a report focused on black sand mining um, to Australian black sand mining projects in in Fiji. Um, so please, please do check out our website and have a look at some of those. Um, we've also got, uh, I've just got some details, sorry, on the final slide here um, of all of the information about the various organisations that have been here today. So if you're interested to learn more about um, extractive development or alternatives to extractive development, or if you'd like to jump on and participate in some of the campaigns, potentially um, sharing information or participating in actions that some of the organisations here today are organising as well, um, please do screenshot it and check it out. Um, we've, um, uh, yeah, I know there's a number of different ways that people here can get involved um, through Jubilee's campaigns as well as the campaigns that the others are running here. Um, anything else that the panelists would like to, to leave us with before we, we finish up today? Nope. Okay. Well, I'd just like to say an enormous thank you to our panelists here. I know um, Charles, Eddie, Samantha, and Pichamon are all incredibly busy people um, who found time out of their schedules to come and share their insights today. Um, and um, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to thank you all for giving your time and for also taking the time to prepare such thoughtful contributions. I know with a one hour session, we were really crammed in terms of what we were actually able to fit in. And it just feels like we could have happily had a 30 minute presentation from each of you and still be left wanting more. So um, thank you all for that contribution and huge thanks to the RDI conference and to all of you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye.